Hi, and welcome to the 2022-23 SPED department meetings. I'm excited for you to be here for our first meeting uh, in September, and we are kicking off our brand new format where we're flipping the content, delivering it to you ahead of time so that you can have some more targeted dialogue and discussion with your special services supervisor during the in-person meeting. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and click on September to get us to the content. The first thing we wanted to do this month is follow up from ULC. Thank you all for a great two days of collaboration and work to kick off the school year. Uh, we're really committed to providing that high quality professional learning informed by our stakeholders needs and reinforced through opportunities for supported application. So, you know, ULC was that kickoff. And now during the department meetings, we wanted to create a touch point just to make sure that we're well positioned um, for providing a FAPE to our students. <clears throat> so with that, we wanted to connect on where things are at with the FAPE planning pathway that we introduced you to in August. Based on the suggested timeline in that document, you really should be all the way through questions one through four at this point. And that fourth question is really centered around getting set up for progress monitoring. So you can be collecting that data to measure whether or not your student is on track to meet their various IEP goals this year. If you have not yet set up a system to start collecting that data, so you haven't maybe identified the tools that you're using or gotten those tools set up, or determined who and where and when and how that data is going to be collected, that really should be your top priority right now. So make sure that you're making effort to do that. If you need assistance with this part of the work, that's okay. Just reach out for help. Ask your mentor, someone on your SPED team, or a services coordinator, and we'll be sure to come alongside and get you set up for success. In addition, we wanted to take this opportunity to just overview for you. Some of you are new to SCRED um, and we introduced you to some of this information this summer, but you got a lot of information this summer. Others are returning. So we thought it would be great to just set the, um, just show you, I guess, how, um, how our supports are set up here at SCRED so that you really have a good picture. Just like the supports that we provide our students in school, we want to make sure that we have a really strong foundation of resources, tools, professional learning, and support available. So we have that, and we've been working on building that up over the last few years. And that foundation for us is really around our key resources. So Case Manager Resources website, the SCRED website, which has been incredibly enhanced over the last um, year and even throughout the summer, and the various professional learning offerings that we have. Those resources are available to everyone. They're designed so that they can be um, on-demand tools that you can use when you need them. So instead of waiting for professional learning about how to write an IEP, when you're sitting down to write an IEP, you have several resources that you can just click and get um, when you need them. In addition, we know that that's not always going to work, that you're not going to get everything that you need from those resources. So your building level mentor, your SST team, including your school psychologist, that's a great next place to go if you need more guidance, need to problem solve a case, get some ideas on how to do something. That team is a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, and is a good place to go when you need a little bit more. From there, your building principal, your AP, your SPED dean, whomever it is that provides that most direct support to your SPED team is a good next step to pull in when that level of support starts to increase. So maybe there's a challenging case that's starting to come up or the special ed team is stuck on where to go next. Your principal, AP dean, whoever that building level administrator is, is a good person to wrap in. And then from there, your SCRED services coordinator and special services supervisor can get involved when more targeted or intensive supports are needed. 
Um, and then finally, uh, me as the director of special education, I'm here too uh, and can come in and assist during the most critical level cases. So just a little image to get you kind of thinking about how to access those supports and maybe where to go when you first um, need some more support. Also quick, wanted to remind people if you haven't reviewed SPED updates, please do so because there's just really good critical information in there about the changes that occurred uh, over the summer at SCRED and just want to make sure everyone's up to date. Uh, we do have 30-day evaluation calendars live on CMR. We mentioned that in the SPED updates. We're working on expanding these to hence charts. So that request has come in from some stakeholders over the last couple of weeks. So just know that we're working on enhancing those 30 school day calendars to include um, that more comprehensive hence chart uh, tool. And then finally, when it comes to ULC uh, circle back, wanted to make sure that you were all aware that we have new on-demand onboarding for new paraprofessionals. We hire paraprofessionals all throughout the school year, not just during August and the summer. So when it comes to onboarding them, we need to make sure that we have tools available to give them their required trainings that must be delivered within their first 60 days of working with students. So those requirements are listed here in the agenda. And there's no action needed on your part as a case manager or special ed team, but we wanted to make sure that you knew that this training was available and that we at SCRED will be working with your district administrative and hiring um, personnel to make sure that this onboarding gets incorporated within that hiring checklist for any new paraprofessional so that they're getting these key trainings um, right at that point of hire. Okay, <clears throat> moving to item two, wanted to talk with you about the database decision making professional learning plan for the year. So this is really our focus for this year is creating a strong infrastructure and practices that support database decision making because we know that that's very critical to developing a healthy multi-tiered system of support or MTSS framework, which includes special education. So when we have strong database decision making in place, that enables more confident and timely decisions. It reduces the amount of risk and decreases bias in our decision making. It gives us a little more control in terms of educational outcomes for our students and opens a path to better future decisions about what those students need. So it's really crucial that when teams come together to make those decisions about student programming, those decisions are rooted in data. And being able to do that takes a lot of work and a lot of infrastructure and system in place so that it's efficient and effective. We know that some of what we ask you to do is above and beyond minimal compliance in terms of graphing and how we make those database decision makings. We wouldn't ask you to do that if we didn't believe and research didn't show that it was incredibly important. So to that end, we are coming alongside to make sure that we're supporting you in building up a really strong infrastructure that includes all sorts of supports and time, professional learning tools to make database decision making as efficient and effective as possible. So in August, we did some level setting around progress monitoring, database decision making, what it is, what it isn't, what it isn't. Um, so you got those messages at ULC. Now we're shifting into more on-site and targeted support. So starting in October and November, we're going to be coming on site in all of the buildings to provide support around setting up progress monitoring because that's really the next most important step in database decision making is setting up those systems to be gathering data and entering data into EduClimber. So this is where we're going to start and our approach is going to be differentiated. So we're going to come in, we're going to assess where the team is at briefly, and then we're going to differentiate that learning and those activities based on the needs of your team in your building. Where we head from there into December and January, what we do in those ongoing sessions throughout the year is largely going to depend on what your team needs and where you're at in that October and November session. So the rest of the plan might flex a little bit depending on what um, 
what we need. And as educators, we know that that's just solid instruction. We have a plan laid out for the year, but we will adjust that plan based on data we gather from your team in that October and November session around setting up progress monitoring. So in terms of next steps, your SSS is working with your principal to solidify those dates. Once those dates are solidified for October and November, you'll receive Google Calendar invites so you know exactly when this learning is going to occur. When that happens, two to three SCRED staff, again, will be coming to your building to facilitate the learning. And we're really working to ensure that that learning is happening via some existing structure so it's not an additional meeting. And I mentioned how those learning activities are going to be differentiated and we're going to include some extension opportunities there as well. Really important, if you are a new staff member, make sure to complete the professional learning training modules in FastBridge prior to administering progress monitoring materials to any of your students. If you are not an educator who delivers progress monitoring tools in FastBridge, you don't use those tools, then you don't have any action here but you have to get that certification. It's mandatory before you administer any of those assessments. So if you haven't done this yet, you can access your training modules by clicking into the training and resources tab um, in that library of training modules, but I'm gonna back up for a minute. All of that, that pathway to get to the FastBridge modules is available through the SCRED website. So if you click on the SCRED website, and you go to databases, and you go to FastBridge, and training and certification, it tells you how to access the training modules here in FastBridge. So that's your resource. So make a space to do that. If you need assistance with doing that, work with your team, work with your building principal on what that looks like. Okay. Item three is around the 15-day withdrawal or 15-day drop um, provision with the state. So for funding purposes, let's talk about why this is necessary. If a student has missed 15 consecutive days of school during the regular school year or five consecutive school days during summer school, which we're through that right now, so now we're focused on school year, without receiving instruction in the home or hospital setting, the school district must drop the student from its enrollment and classify them as withdrawn. So that's laid out in a Minnesota statute. That's a legal requirement that we have. However, when that occurs, the student remains eligible for admission and the district's obligations for child find and the provision of special ed services are not negated. So let's talk a little bit more about what this means. So that 15-day withdrawal provision or 15-day drop, what that does is it just prevents the district from claiming membership through the state. So that, in other words, we're not getting funding for the student during that time, okay? So the enrollment status for the student changes, but until the student enrolls in a different school district, the current district remains responsible and should continue to monitor special ed timelines and reach out to the family um, and if applicable, report those excessive applicants to the county officials. So this 15 day drop provision looks a little different in terms of how you track it, whether it's early childhood or K-12. So we have a couple of examples here to help outline that. In early childhood, you're not counting 15 days of when the student should be at school. You're counting 15 days in terms of scheduled weeks of instruction. So for a student who doesn't isn't scheduled to attend school every day, so maybe it's a preschool student who attends school two days per week, you're counting 15 days of potential instruction for the program. So there you're counting weeks. So for that student, it's going to only end up being six days of scheduled time they were going to be there across three weeks or approximately 15 school days. So that gets a little confusing. Hopefully these examples help clarify. So let's look at Sunny. Sunny's receiving special education services in her home and is scheduled to have a home visit once per week. Her parents canceled three weeks in a row for various reasons. 
Sunny would be withdrawn and would need to re-enroll in order for the district to resume claiming any membership. So she missed three sessions or three weeks. However, during this time, Sunny's special education team continues to attempt to make contact with her parents and prepare for her upcoming annual IFSP. Those attempts get documented in the communication log, and the team continues to try to work with Sunny and her family um, so that we stay in contact. We let them know we're ready to serve and try to stay engaged so we can get that annual IFSP hopefully done um, on or close to that, um, that deadline. And again, documenting those attempts, recognizing that the parent is not responding, but we haven't um, heard anything formally from them in terms of a formal move or withdrawal. In example two, we have Stan, who's in seventh grade. Stan's absent for 15 consecutive school days. He does not receive homebound instruction during this time, so he must be withdrawn after that 15th absence. The school team continues to reach out to Stan's parents and is attempting to schedule an IEP meeting. A truancy report is made to the county. After canceling the IEP meeting once, the team reschedules and the parent shows up to that second attempt and the IEP team works with the parent to get Stan re-enrolled and develop a new IEP with increased services and support to promote attendance. So this is a really ideal situation here where because we stayed engaged with the family, we were able to get Stan back into school and maybe recalculate that IEP a little bit to provide some increased supports for Stan. On CMR, we have a page around um, withdrawal and this a section around 15 days consecutive absence. And we have some tools on this page for teams to use when a student is starting to approach that 15 day drop, including a seven day warning letter that alerts the parents that the student has a significant number of absences and that they're heading toward that drop provision and then the 15 day drop ready to serve letter. Questions about that, um, please note that and your special services supervisor will be happy to discuss. Okay, item four is around collaborative planning proposals. So uh, to, we just wanted to provide some clarity around the rationale for the different planned rounds for collaborative planning funds because we're seeing some different things come in with requests so we wanted to provide some clarity and kind of move forward with that. So again, there's two types of proposals for collaborative planning projects. The first one is a planned project. So these are things that a team anticipates, they know they want to do, they're looking ahead to the future and making some plans for utilizing those funds within their program. So this, the most common request we get here is around pulling together groups of paraprofessionals to provide ongoing professional learning work guidance um, and direction in terms of um, student needs, so better meeting those needs. The second type of project is an unanticipated project. So maybe this is a student moves in with a high level of needs from a different district and we need to really sit down and do some planning to reallocate resources, design programming, and determine um, how to best support that student. So we didn't see that coming. We didn't know that student was going to move in, move in. So we have those unanticipated projects that can be reviewed at any time. When it comes to a planned project, only include the meetings or dates that will fall within the windows of each of those rounds outlined above. So for example, if you have a project that will go from October through June, so using that paraprofessional example, you know that you want to meet with your paraprofessionals once per month, October through June. And so you want to submit a collaborative planning request for that purpose. You're going to submit one request for the October through December dates because those dates fall within round two. So by September 15th, you're going to submit that request for the October through December dates via that Google form. Then you're going to submit another request for the January through June dates via the Google form by December 15th. And we know that might feel like extra work needing to submit two requests, but the rationale for this is sound. Because those windows for planned projects were set with intention, because there's only a limited amount of funds available for each district for this project. So we want to ensure that all of the money for a district isn't allocated 
within those first two months of the school year on that first come first serve kind of rush and that we have money set aside should those planned projects come up at other points in the school year. We really want to be equitable as we're distributing those funds. So it's really important that we stick to these rounds. Moving forward, we are going to be kicking the requests back if those requests are including dates beyond the scope of that round. So just know that we're just, again, this is coming from a good place and ensuring that we're distributing those funds with intention and with equity across the school year. If you get to a point later in the school year where you really need some support for a project and the funds aren't available, we're, we will work with you and your building administrator to problem solve how to meet that need. Specifics around the collaborative planning project, including the procedure, the page that outlines the project on CMR, the procedure, and the Google form to request, request funds are all linked here. Okay. Item five is licensing grids. So we have various requirements for who is on an IEP and evaluation team based on license from federal and state requirements. So we want to make sure that you have clear and consistent communication regarding these requirements and that you know who in your district serves as the licensed people across those various um, disability categories. So to do this, we've created the licensing team grids, which are linked for you here. All we're asking you to do is review the licensing team grid for your district. So you can get to these either by clicking directly here or on CMR. These are available on the web page under evaluation planning. So you can see who is licensed in your district. You can click on your district logo and it brings you right to your um, district licensing team grid. On here, you're going to see a, row, a column for special permission. So if people are on an out of field permission, tier one or tier two license, it's noted there. File folder numbers and expiration dates for those licenses. Just another tool to help keep that visible for everyone. First name, last name, your building or buildings of assignment. And then all the disability categories are listed along the top here with those drop downs around who holds that license in your district. Okay. At the bottom, you'll see the SCRED staff who support your district, the SCRED itinerant teachers. Um, and again, that same information about what licenses they hold. Note, deaf, blind, OHD, and TBI do not have licenses, but the people who hold relevant licenses or who would serve on those teams if needed are listed here. So if you had a really unique um, health condition and a student with a really high needs medical condition who was served under OHD and you needed um, someone on that team to help provide support in that regard, Connie is the person, Connie Sim is the teacher to bring in, even though there's not formally a license required there. Just an example. So what we're asking you to do is to review your district's licensing team grid and your name to make sure that everything is accurate, that your current licenses are listed um, and that your uh, out of field permission or tier one or tier two or tier three or tier four is all accurate. If it is, no action needed. If it's not, if there's a mistake, you notify your SSS either via email or at the in-person meeting that's coming up in the next couple weeks. There are some additional supporting resources available that talk about how to um, approach cross-categorical cross case management and services um, within our system because we have some procedures uh, in place to make sure that we're upholding those requirements and that you know what's needed should you be case managing a student who has a primary disability other than your license. So those are all there for you if you need them. Uh, <clears throat> this is also that time of year where we update provider numbers in SPED form. So we've turned over, we have new staff in place. So those provider numbers are really important because we use them to report to MDE regarding um, who provides services to which students and how much services are provided to various disability categories and students in various federal settings. So it's really important that those numbers are accurate 
for that reporting period, okay? Because it's used to inform special education reimbursement and tuition billing rates. So the more accurate those numbers are, the more accurate our tuition billing rates are, and that results in um, funding for our district. So that's really important. So we do a lot of work behind the scenes, um, but that you don't need to know about. That would just be a lot of extra detail and information. Your part is making sure that your service provider number is in SPED forms and is accurate. So there is guidance on CMR for how to do this. If you click on this link, it will bring you right to the page that shows you how to change your provider number in SPED forms. All you're going to do is go into the working file for your students and right here in the services grid, there's a box for provider number. You either just type your number in directly if you know it by heart, or if you don't, you click the hyperlink for provider and it'll bring up a list of potential providers for you to then select your name and enter in the number. Quick aside, that provider number list is extremely long. We are working on cleaning that up and removing um, users who are no longer employed within our system. That's work that's happening. So we are working on cleaning that list up. Just wanted to mention that. Um, one of the things that we need you to decide though as a building before diving too deeply into this work is whether case managers will complete this for all the students on their caseload for all of their services. That's the recommended method or service providers going in for all students that they serve. If you go the case manager route, one person will make the change in each student's IEP. If you go the service provider route, multiple people will need to go in and complete that for the students that they serve. So it's just a matter of figuring out which route you want to take for your students and then making sure that that gets communicated to the SCRED itinerant teaching staff in terms of what you need from them, if anything. This task um, needs to be completed by Friday, October 7th. Also, just a tip, you can check the teacher workload analysis under educator reports to see a list of the students you serve. Um, and just that's a good cross check, cross reference in terms of making sure that you've got that full service load in place. Um, just make sure that you're looking at working IEPs rather than finalized because that's where the information with these updated provider numbers lives. Okay. Two more items. Um, there was a change to SPED forms, um, to one of the forms in SPED forms. So I want to outline that and make sure that the guidance is clear. So SPED forms made an update to the notice of team meeting form that includes an additional field for district representative. So we have the table for listing the people you expect to attend the meeting. And then below, there is this new additional box for district representative. Okay, the feature can't be turned off. Um, so, and it prints whether or not you enter text in there. So it's really important that when you're completing a notice of team meeting, that you enter the name of your qualified district representative, so your principal, your AP, or someone else who has been authorized to um, fulfill that role, so that um, has been delegated that administrative authority, that you put their name both in the table for persons expected to attend the meeting and district representative at the bottom. Um, Again, if it's printed and nothing's written in that district rep box, it looks like it's blank and we forgot it. And if you don't put their name in the table above, it doesn't roll over to the IEP. And that's really important that that person is listed uh, as an IEP team member on the IEP itself. We know it's redundant and it's frustrating to enter two names in right <laughs> next to each other. Um, so we have submitted a support request to SPED forms to see if we can just get that district rep field to roll over to the IEP automatically to prevent that redundancy. So we'll keep you posted on that. And then last but not least, wanted to uh, provide you with some information around relicensure training options at SCRED. Um, so we have um, a few different options for, for SCRED staff. Sorry, I got a little bit lost in the text there. 
Um, so any teacher who needs to renew their license has to submit a certain number of continuing education units or CEUs in a certain array of categories to the Professional Educator Licensing and Standings Board or PELSB. Okay. So as a member of SCRED, you have access to two primary and ongoing resources for on-demand and cost-free professional learning that will get you CEUs. The first is Infinitech. So that's a subscription-based program that provides access to literally hundreds of professional learning options. So you can set up an account for free. Um, we have a subscription on behalf of all of our districts with Infinitech. So you can go in, create your account, and browse those offerings to get what you need at any time. In addition, Scred's, um, some SCRED staff have cataloged a variety of asynchronous professional learning offerings that can be accessed by clicking here. So these are in the SCRED website. And we've organized these asynchronous offerings by required category of training. So we have accommodations, modifications, adaptations of curriculum materials and strategies, cultural competency, English language learner, mental illness, positive behavior intervention, reading, and suicide prevention. There's some additional multi-category sources there too. You can get to those at any time, again, cost-free. But then a bonus we wanted to make sure you're aware of is that the IRIS Center is offering free CEUs for teachers through December of 2022. So it's a great opportunity to access professional learning on a wide range of topics related to special ed and beyond for free that you'd otherwise need to um, pay for. So if you go to the IRIS Center, here you can see one of their modules highlighted there. You can go to PD Options and PD Certificates for Educators which overviews what this is and then allows you to, if you scroll down, you can get started by setting up an account. And again, these are free through December of 2022 and then there will be a cost associated. So those SCRED resources are available at any time. If you wanna get in and take advantage of something you wouldn't um, otherwise have access to, feel free to explore the IRIS Center. And even if you don't have to renew your license this year, these are great options for you to start building up that CEU bank over time. All right, lots of info in September, um, lots we wanted to bring you. Again, your special services supervisor will be coming on site to answer questions, um, get some more information from you in terms of where things are at with your team, what supports you need, and talk through any kind of local concerns or priorities that are going on this year um, so that you can work together to continue to move your system forward. So thanks for your time. Thanks for reviewing this information carefully, and we will talk to you real soon.